delighted to welcome you to this Association of Physicians webinar. Um, this is a very exciting subject. We know that over the last 50 years, the developments in application of immune therapy to cancer treatments are probably the most important development, both conceptually and also in terms of making inroads into some of the most intractable uh, cancers to date. We have a stellar lineup of speakers for you today, and I will move straight to the first of our speakers, who is Dr. Z. Tipu, medical oncologist at the Royal Marsden and clinical research fellow at the Francis Crick Institute, who works with Dr. Sam Turalic and Professor James Larkin. The title of his speech is, What Have We Learned About Tumor Immun Immunity from Therapeutic Vac Vaccinations? And over to you, Zed. Uh, sure, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I'm not sure I'd describe myself as stellar, but certainly present. And um, for those that are expecting some trials, I apologize. He wasn't able to make uh, the meeting today, but I will be standing in her place. Um, and I'm very grateful to the organizing committee for inviting and extending the opportunity for me to present today. So the title of my talk that I was instructed was How is Immunotherapy Also the Way Your Patients Are Treated and, and Survive Cancer? And as Stuart mentioned, um, I'm a medical oncology registrar at Marsden and a clinical research fellow at the Francis Crick Institute by background. Um, so um, without giving an extended history of um, immunotherapy, I think the way in which a number of oncologists and other healthcare physicians think about immunotherapy is always about immune checkpoint blockade. And we know that this is kind of a slightly more narrow approach to this, and there are a number of other therapeutic agents, some of which you'll hear about today. But focusing in on immune checkpoint blockade, we know that this really came into kind of our standard of care treatments within the last 10 to 15 years. But actually the evidence for this is backdated by, you know, a couple of centuries dating back to the late 19th century, where we know American surgeons demonstrated the intralesional injection of various bacteria associated with regressions in sarcomas patients, and really highlighted the importance of the adaptive immune system, especially our, our T cell populations in propagating this anti-tumor response. And certainly we know that a number of tumors um, are immunogenic uh, and Paradoxically, in the context of kidney cancer, which I've highlighted on the slide, but also breast cancer, tumor infiltration by the immune system inversely associates with prognosis. And a number of the underpinning reasons as to why associates with kind of a seminal work that Hanahan and Weinberg published back in 2000 in terms of the tumor's ability to avoid immune destruction. And a prime way of doing this is by upregulating or associating with immune checkpoints which we've associated or developed drug treatments for certainly within the last decade and which we target for, for therapeutic modulation and augmenting our adaptive uh, immune response. So the schematic over the next couple of slides basically outlines the mechanisms of action for immune checkpoint blockade and a number of you will be familiar with this so I will be relatively quick. We know that our uh, CD8 T cell population is dependent on activation at the TCR by um, antigen presenting uh, cells, which present neoantigens in terms of malignancy via their MHC, which results in T cell propagation and an anti tumoral response. As I was mentioning from, from the work that Hanahan and Weinberg demonstrated back in 2000, we know that tumors or malignancy in general can modulate the T cell response and suppress it by interaction with PD-1 and CTLA-4 as examples of immune checkpoints expressed by T cells. We know that they have a role homeostatically in normal physiological conditions in terms of regulating autoimmunity, but we know that malignant cells or tumor cells can also harness these in terms of deregulating or downregulating T cell activity through interaction through PD-1, CTLA-4 and their various ligands. And what the work that kind of Jim Allison did in the US and Otsuka Honjo did in Japan, certainly at the latter part of the last century, was to develop therapeutics targeting these immune checkpoints. So many of you will be aware of drugs such as nivolumab and anti-PD-1, ipilimumab and anti-CTLA-4. And these are humanized monoclonal antibodies which are targeting um, uh, these immune checkpoints and have resulted in durable survival outcomes for a proportion of, for a proportion of our patients. 
And as I highlighted on the previous slide, some of these drugs very much have become standard of care treatment um, across a number of phenotypes. And many of you will be familiar having looked after these patients across a number of specialties alongside their ensuing toxicity, which I know Alex will, will talk about in due course. But drugs such as nivolumab and pembrolizumab, licensed melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, amongst other cancer types in which target uh, PD-1, uh, whilst also having drugs such as ipilimumab, which often combines with nivolumab as a target to anti-CTLA-4. And the plot that is on this slide is representative of the number of FDA approvals, and this is mirrored slightly more conservatively by EMA and NICE over the last 10 years, 10 years or so, across a number of these targets. So we know that in terms of regulation and drug approval, this started with anti-CTLA-4 treatment. So the drug ipilimumab in, in melanoma, which, which was um, licensed and regulated back in 2011 as a single agent, and was then subsequently combined with um, nivolumab, an anti-PD-1 drug, a couple of years later, resulting in durable um, survival outcomes, certainly in melanoma. But outside of melanoma, we've seen an expansion across a number of other tumor types, namely kidney cancer, so clear cell RPC, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, and more recently beyond that. And what we are now starting to do in, in oncology in general is look beyond PD-1, CTLA-4, and actually beyond checkpoint blockade in general. But certainly in terms of immune checkpoints, we know that there's an increasing signal for other immune checkpoint targets. And um, relatively 047, Relativity 047 was published earlier this year and demonstrated the efficacy of what was an anti-lag-3 um, as a potential target alongside PD-1 treatment. And as I mentioned, this has resulted in really durable survival outcomes in markedly chemo or previously chemorefractory tumor types. And I think melanoma is a prime exemplar in, in this regards. So melanoma historically very much chemorefractory. We saw survival outcomes of 8% over two years, the decarbazine, which was the standard of care treatment up until six or seven years ago. And then we've kind of seen kind of this landmark change in terms of, or paradigm shift in terms of outcomes for melanoma with the advent of single agent and subsequent dual immune checkpoint blockade. And the capital mark curve on the right-hand side of the slide is from Checkmate 067, which is the real registration study for a combination immunotherapy and has resulted in 50% of page, uh, patients with advanced disease surviving up into six and a half years from follow-up. And what I think is the most remarkable thing that you can see on, on the slide is this real flattening of these survival curves. So this is probably a durable response now for these patients. And I suppose more recently than five or six years ago, we've seen a change in paradigm shift in terms of their outlook, in terms of integrating these into early stage disease, both in neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting. And this is all about treating micrometastatic disease, reducing the risk of relapse and ideally cure. And certainly in the context of melanoma and more recently non-small cell lung cancer and RTC, we're seeing increasing drug licenses. And where we've seen pathological complete responses associated with chemotherapy in breast cancer associating with durable survival outcomes, we're now starting to see that leveraging immune checkpoint blockade in a number of other cancer types. And this was data presented at ESMO, one of our European oncology conferences a couple of months ago, leveraging neoadjuvant um, pembrolizumab for melanoma, again, associated with good survival outcomes. But the story is a little bit more muddy than that. And certainly you'll have noticed that the recurrent exemplar that I've been using is melanoma. And that is as a result of good durable responses in this cancer type. But there's a real heterogeneity in response. Whilst melanoma on the plot here is towards the top end of the curve, certainly diseases such as soft tissue sarcoma, prostate cancer are relatively immunotherapy refractory. And there's a real unmet clinical need in, the, in, these, uh, in these cancer types. And certainly immunotherapy is not a one size fits all for treatment of oncological malignancies and further consideration is certainly needed. And so when we're looking at this Kaplan marker from Checkmate 067 and you know, commenting on that 50% survival at six and a half years and how fantastic it is, we also need to reflect on the 50% of patients that aren't surviving, those that are immunotherapy refractory and how we best manage and identify these questions. And there are a number of unanswered questions in the immunotherapy space. And those include, as a, as a, as a minimal selection, identify, identification of, of decent predictive biomarkers, how we maximize efficacy and minimize toxicity. And Alex will be talking about some of the quite significant cardiotoxicity that we can see in some of the patients. 
And also, what about the trial excluded populations? We know that these aren't representative of the wider oncology community, those with a poor performance status, those with brain metastases, those with concurrent conditions such as autoimmune diseases, which would predispose them from going on to these registration studies. And equally, and I'm not really going to touch on this today, what's beyond immune checkpoint blockade in terms of next and sequential lines of treatment. Um, and I'm going to skip this because I appreciate I'm probably coming up close to time already, but um, there is an increasing vogue towards interrogating predictive biomarkers, identifying cohorts of pa patients beyond standard stage and grade and histological subtype criteria to leverage and improve performance and efficacy of immune checkpoint blockades. PDL1, which we can determine by IHG, has been uh, licensed in certain cancer types, but is an imperfect biomarker associated with problems in terms of the assays that we use, but also tumor heterogeneity of PDL1 expression. We know from single region biopsies this is likely underrepresentative. Mutational burden, human TMB or MMR deficiency has been associated with good survival outcomes and it's good predictive capacity and also gene uh, expression signatures that we can derive from, from RNA seq analysis. Um, so in terms of tumor mutational burden, for those that may not be aware, this is the total number of somatic mutations per megabase in any interrogated part of the genome. And this associates with a higher neoantigen burden, and thus you can kind of make sense, associates with a more durable or stronger adapted T-cell response. But we know that there is heterogeneity in TMB between tumor types. Melanoma, that exemplar I, I was currently using is plotted right out on the right-hand side, but you can see you know, chromophobe-type kidney cancer, neuroblastoma very much enriched on the left-hand side with lower somatic mutational prevalence. But we know that TMB can be a fairly robust biomarker for immune checkpoint inhibitors. So you can see containing small cell lung cancer, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, associating with good objective response rates with higher TMBs. But there are outliers, Merkel cell, RCC, where we don't know where this neoantigen source in it and had historically lower levels of TMB, but it's still associating with, with decent responses to immune checkpoint blockades. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. So we know that MMR deficiency, so mismatch re uh, repair deficiency, can be either a somatic or germline mutation. For germline mutations, many of you will have heard of Lynch syndrome, which in, uh, predisposes to frame shift or insertion or deletion mutations, which are then not repaired and results in this rich neoantigen burden. Uh, the FDA approved for the first time in a pan cancer or tumor agnostic setting the approval of pembrolizumab and anti PD1 for all those that are MMR deficient. And actually, the waterfall plot, which I've produced here, was, was disseminated very publicly in, in the oncology community off the back of ESMO, demonstrating fantastic responses to uh, neoadjuvant uh, anti PD1 treatment in MMR deficient colorectal cancer. But again, this is a minority of patients. It's not addressing those that are MMR proficient. And we know that our drug treatments have a range and plethora of toxicities, the kinetics of which can vary, and the severity of which very much is variable, from relatively insidious and self-limiting to having significant impacts on life, and certainly in the context of endocrine toxicity, which we know largely are irreversible. So identifying patients who are most likely to benefit from treatment and equally minimizing those that are having toxicity, and a number of groups, including our own, are doing a lot of predictive biomarker work, leveraging multi-omic analysis in the toxicity space are really trying to better identify this. Um, I'm going to skip over these slides because I'm talking for too long. But in terms of the trial excluded populations, we know that there are outstanding questions. What about those with autoimmune disease? Anybody on a steroid dose of greater than 10 milligrams was excluded from trials by definition. But we know that these patients are more likely to experience toxicity and equally flare whilst on treatment. And what about those with poor performance status? Potentially those with the greatest clinical need for durable survival outcomes are probably being underserved by immunotherapy. We know that efficacy um, uh, data from limited retrospective cohort studies that actually the survival outcomes of these patients, those with a performance status of two or worse, are, are pretty poor. Um, and I think for one of the last slides, what about those that are getting toxicity? If this toxicity is limiting and self-managing, what if we re-expose these uh, patients to treatment? And again, unfortunately, this is an underserved population by the registration studies who inherently wouldn't have been included, but are demonstrating that these patients, again, are susceptible to toxicity and probably aren't having durable and decent survival outcomes where we know immunosuppression blunts the efficacy of treatment.
Um, I'm going to leave that as my last slide because I know others are going to be talking about kind of the treatment space beyond immune checkpoint inhibition, but happy to take any questions towards the, towards the end. Thank you very much indeed, Zed. And uh, I'm particularly impressed, not only are you an opening batsman, but you can deal with the curveball of me announcing the wrong title for your talk. Um, so really well done. Thank you very much indeed. We'll move on now to Dr. John Mayer, who is a senior clean, uh, clinical senior lecturer in immunology in King's College. He has particular research interests in uh, adaptive immunotherapy of cancer using engineered lymphocytes, and therefore, as a self-styled car mechanic, is perfectly suited to talking to the subject CAR T cell therapy, how far can it go? And just to make the point that if you have questions that you'd like me to facilitate at the end of this meeting to our speakers, please include them on the chat. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart, for the uh, introduction and also for the invitation to, uh, to give my biased perspective on CAR-T, where we've got to and potentially where we might uh, end up. So I thought I'd start by explaining exactly what a CAR or a chimeric antigen receptor is. So these are completely artificial or synthetic fusion receptors, which you can literally design on your PC in an afternoon. And they, they consist of a number of components. On the exterior, you have a targeting moiety, which is usually an antibody fragment directed against a cell surface molecule found on a tumor cell. And that targeting moiety is separated from the membrane of the immune effector cell by a spacer domain. Then you have a membrane spanning domain. And finally, you have the business end of the molecule, the so-called signaling domain. So essentially what you're trying to do with this technology is to reprogram immune cells, most commonly T cells, so that they can recognize a target antigen found on the cell surface of a cancer cell or another uh, diseased cell type. Now there's a, there's a trend to think that CAR-T is quite a new technology, but actually CAR-Ts have been around since the late 1980s. And there have been a number of generations of these molecules which have been described over that period of time. The first generation CAR is what I've just described in essence, where you have these, uh, these fusion elements coupled to an activating domain. Generally, the um, zeta subunit of the CD3 complex, this is a, a molecule which is naturally involved in the activation of T cells. Unfortunately, first generation CARs did not work when they were tested in the clinic. And what has caused these molecules to make the leap uh, into the clinic was the introduction of second generation CARs. And, and these differ by virtue of the introduction of a single so-called co-stimulatory module upstream of that activating moiety. So second generation CARs are what has caused all of the hoopla around this particular technology in the clinic. And they come in two flavors. Uh, there are two camps really, one of which employs CD28 to deliver the co-stimulatory signal, and the other employs a, a very different co-stimulatory receptor known as 41BB. And these can actually be considered a little bit like the tortoise and the hare in the sense that CD28 co-stimulation acts very rapidly, these cells uh, will, will tend to expand very briskly in the patient, but they don't tend to persist for as long as 41BB co-stimulated CAR T cells, where the initial activating signal is not as intense, but you tend to see a greater persistence. The two technologies tend to work more or less similarly in the clinic in the context of blood cancers. There have been other generations developed more recently, such as third generation CARs, where people use both of these co-stimulatory moieties, one aligned on top of the other. And certainly to my perspective, this technology has not really advanced the field, probably because the downstream co-stimulatory module is not fully functionally enabled in this particular architecture. Now, I've worked in the CAR-T space for more than 20 years, and I can certainly remember the early days when I was advised by my academic seniors that I was wasting my time and that this was a completely kind of uh, ivory towers type academic uh, endeavor, which would never impact upon patient care. And what's caused the transition from that perspective to where we see CAR-T at the moment was the realization that this technology could be used to target B-cell malignancies. And the thinking here is very simple. B cells 
right from the point at which they differentiate in the bone marrow, right through to the most uh, mature stages of B cell differentiation. At all of these stages, B cells generally will express the CD19 antigen. And not only healthy B cells, but derived B cell malignancies also express CD19 in the vast majority of cases. And we know from clinical experience with primary immunodeficiencies, such as common variable immunodeficiency or Bruton's a gamma globulinemia, that patients can survive without B cells or without antibodies if they are properly treated with immunoglobulin replacement therapy. And with this thinking in mind, people designed CAR T cells directed against the CD19 antigen. And this is one of the early patients treated with this technology, a girl called Emma Whitehead. She, um, um, I'll show you a movie about her in, in just a moment, but what you see here uh, is a recording of her temperature after administration of CAR T cells. And this was one of the early demonstrations of a toxicity that we see a lot of with this technology known as cytokine uh, release syndrome. And it doesn't really matter which cytokine you measure in the bloodstream of these patients, they're all off the scale in the height of this particular toxic event. This is um, a movie of Emma. It's, it's from a blog that her family have actually been maintaining. And this is the day that she received CAR T cells, the first child in the world to receive CD19 targeted CAR T for B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And you can see how miserable she looks here. She's only seven at the time of receiving these cells, but she clearly had a pretty good idea of the fact that she was seriously ill. What the blog does not show is what happened to Emma 24 hours later, she developed, as I've shown you uh, in the previous slide, she developed high fever and that evolved into cytokine release syndrome, as a result of which she was admitted to ITU, intubated, received presser drugs, and she was treated empirically with the only available anti-cytokine biologics which the physicians at UPenn had available to them, namely tocilizumab and etanercept. And within 24 hours, she was, she was better by all accounts. And the next entry in the blog is this movie uh, three months later. And you can see that you're dealing with a totally different girl here. She went into complete remission following infusion of CAR-T. And indeed, that happened uh, 10 years ago. And people are now using the C word about her. Uh, Emma is the poster child of CAR-T, but there are several hundred, if not thousands of patients who have um, similarly benefited from CAR-T cell immunotherapy for B cell malignancy, and more recently using BCMA targeted CAR T cells to treat uh, multiple myeloma. What you see on this slide here is a kind of a time course of how CAR T has developed. The first case report that I came across of a patient treated with CD19 targeted CAR T was in 2010, published in Blood. And I can tell you that that case report of a patient who achieved a partial response did not attract a great deal of excitement. What really set the field alight were the initial reports in 2011 of patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, actually a disease that's very difficult to treat with CD19 CAR T, but there was a description of um, two patients who went into complete remission with CD19 CAR T, and believe me, this caused a great deal of excitement in the field. Uh, it got to a point in the early part of the decade that you couldn't um, pick up a copy of the New England Journal, but you were seeing another clinical trial from one of the large US centers describing the efficacy of CD19 car targeted uh, CAR T in one or other of the B cell malignancies. And the field rapidly pivoted from these academic studies over to the, um, the, uh, uh, the undertaking of phase three clinical trials, largely by, by pharmaceutical, biotech and pharma companies. And this represented a real, um, I suppose, change in the perspective of the pharmaceutical industry of this very new way to treat human disease. I can tell you that if you went into a large pharma company before 2010 and proposed a cellular immunotherapy as a treatment for cancer, you would have been ejected uh, with the largest barge pole available to them because this type of treatment does not fit the traditional business model of drug development where you want to produce a large batch of a pharmaceutical so that you can treat many, many thousands of patients. Typically, CAR-T, on the other hand, is an autologous product which, in which a single batch of drug treats a single patient. But seven years after that first case report, we already had two approved drugs in the US 
for the treatment of B-cell malignancy. And CAR-T has now developed, become the largest growth area in immuno-oncology, outstripping even immune checkpoint blockade, a statistic I must say I found really, really surprising when I came across it. We now stand at seven CAR-T products approved across the world, six of which are approved in the US, uh, and one is a, a product approved in Spain for B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And you will see the two latest additions to, the, to this list, Beckma and Carvicti, are both BCMA-targeted CAR-T for multiple myeloma. I think this is my last slide, and it summarizes all of the problems. Um, CAR-T is incredibly expensive, it's very, very difficult to deliver uh, and also to manufacture. And um, the, the complete response rates in B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, I think it's fair to say are unprecedented with upwards of 90% CORs seen in patients with relapsed refractory malignancy. But many of these responses are not durable. And we're also seeing a big issue with antigen loss, e.g. CD19 loss in, as, a, as a cause of treatment failure. Another problem with the autologous products that are being developed at the moment is the vein to vein time. You know, it can take um, a month or longer to uh, manufacture a CAR T product and to release that product for clinical administration. And of course, patients need bridging therapies during that period of time. Scalable manufacture is a real issue. And I'm very happy to speak about that if time permits in the Q&A. And of course, CAR-T does not work where need is greatest in the context of solid tumors. So, so I will stop there and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. John, thank you for a wonderful survey of uh, CAR-T. Uh, car mechanics have never looked so exciting. Um, I'm going to move swiftly across to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Alexander Lyon. Uh, who is the clinical lead for the um, cardio-oncology service at the Royal Brompton Hospital. Alex and I set this service up over 10 years ago as the first such uh, bespoke unit in the United Kingdom. And uh, at least from my point of view, this has been a hugely fun ride ever since. Alex has gone on to um, be president of the British Cardio-Oncology Society and is now chair of the ESC Cardio-Oncology Council um, and spreading the word across Europe. We'll move across to you now, Alex, to talk about um, immune checkpoint inhibitors and cardiovascular toxicity. I think you're mu muted, Alex. I can't hear you yet. Still not. We've got a little freeze. Stuart, can you hear me? Uh, now you're on. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So I heard you and I share that enthusiasm and joy and pleasure at our journey together over the last 11 years. And thank you to the Association of Physicians for the invitation. So, of course, cardiology and Oncology have lived in different worlds, but now with the increased survivorship from both uh, uh, conditions and specialties, we're having patients come to the other specialty with their following diseases. Now, in the case of cardio oncology, that's cardiovascular diseases caused by cancer therapies, we've known for many years that anthracycline chemotherapy causes heart failure high-dose radiation to the chest, particularly mantle radiotherapy used in the 1970s to 1990s, pericardial disease and bowel disease, and with the expansion of 5 fluorouracil and capecitabine for GI and ovarian and breast malignancies, we've seen a lot of coronary ischemia and vasospasm. But what's really driven this field is the new targeted molecular therapies. And here's a list of modern cancer treatments where we've received a patient because they've developed a cardiovascular problem whilst on the treatment. And today we're going to focus on the immune checkpoint inhibitors, which you've already heard from Ziad about. So as a cardiologist, I think of these as antibodies, which are taking the brakes off the immune system in order to target their T cell uh, uh, immunity to 
a malignancy, and they're now licensed for all these different cancers on the right, with, in many cases, very dramatic improvements in long-term survival. So what about the cardiovascular complications? Well, in the uh, early years, we didn't know. And to be honest, even now, the true incidence is unknown, and it a lot depends on definitions. Before 2016, there were a few case reports, but in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016, two cases of fatal checkpoint inhibitor-induced myocarditis were reported. And they scanned the pharmacovigilance database and found another 18 cases. Uh, and this was rare, but it was fatal in 50% of the cases. And if patients were treated with two of these checkpoint inhibitors, the risk was much higher than if they had monotherapy. Now, this led to a growing awareness. In, in 2017, a French group reported 30 cases. Then another 101 cases were reported through a WHO Vigi base, with 75% of them reported since the New England Journal paper. What does it look like? Well, a cohort of uh, centers in America published this paper in 2018 to give a first insight. Now, this was 35 cases. They tend to be triggered early in the first four cycles of treatment. And many cases, and we see this, are after the first dose or the second dose. They can be accompanied by other immunotoxicities, particularly myositis, myasthenia gravis, and uh, skin and lung and GI toxicities in about half of cases. Now, to have a diagnosis of myocarditis, you generally need a raised troponin. So by definition, the troponin was up in most of these patients. But what was clear is, like the New England Journal paper, whilst this seemed relatively rare, it was still very serious when it occurred. 46% of these cases had what in cardiology we call a major adverse cardiac event, or MACE, that is cardiovascular death, cardiogenic shock, cardiac arrest, or complete heart block. So clearly a rare but very serious side effect. What they found is that here the ECG was usually abnormal, but can be normal in a minority of cases. As we showed, the troponin was generally elevated. But here's interesting insight. You didn't have to have a reduction in your left ventricular ejection fraction, i.e. heart failure caused by your myocarditis to have the diagnosis and potential complications. And natriuretic peptides such as the NT pro BMP were elevated in approximately two thirds of cases. So we published together with our Marsden colleagues our experience in 2018. And what we saw is, first of all, myocarditis, which can be complicated by heart failure or ventricular arrhythmias, pericarditis, which again you can imagine is autoimmune due to. Uh, an autoimmune activation of the T lymphocytes against the pericardium, and this may be complicated by an effusion or tamponade. Vasculitis, which uh, can occur in the coronary arteries and so sort of cause an acute coronary syndrome, but more commonly plaque rupture of patients with pre-existing coronary disease where we know inflammation plays a role. But intriguingly, we also saw new complete heart block with progressive PR interval and then a complete heart block uh, in the absence of myocarditis. And as you'll see also non-inflammatory heart failure, particularly with longer duration of treatment where inflammation wasn't present, but the LV impairment developed. Earlier this year, we published the European Society of Cardiology guideline on cardio-oncology. And just to give you a flavor in the first Eight weeks since publication, it's had almost 110,000 views at the web page and almost 37,000 downloads. So this is a growing uh, topic in world cardiology and oncology. And within it, we have the management algorithm for uh, the treatment of patients who develop a checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. So what's key is that they must discontinue the checkpoint inhibitor. We don't actually know the physiological treatment half-life of these drugs because it's about the T uh, lymphocytes. They must be admitted to hospital if they're seen in an outpatient setting and have continuous ECG monitoring given the risk of both fatal ventricular arrhythmias and heart block. They should be treated with high-dose methylprednisolone with a bolus each day for the first three days and then a review of their response. Most fortunately recover with this and then can be switched to an oral prednisolone with weekly 
weaning of the dose and weekly monitoring of the troponin to ensure it wants that having been suppressed by the high dose IV methylpred, it does not re-emerge. Steroid refractory cases require a second line immunosuppression. And there are the cases who are hemodynamically unstable with cardiogenic shock who should be in, in, admitted to intensive care and have modern mechanical cardiac support therapy for cardiogenic shock, such as ECMO or LVAD, if the prognosis is potentially good. And these, of course, are now being used in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting, as well as the metastatic setting, where overall survival is significantly better. It's important to use high doses of methylprednisolone and early, as shown by this study that I was a co-author, where a group of centers around the world called their experience. And here you see the MACE free survival. So just to remind you, this is major adverse cardiac events and uh, the MACE free survival as a Kaplan-Meier in time from the diagnosis of myocarditis. In the blue line are the patients who had a high dose of steroids started within 24 hours of the diagnosis and they had 100% MACE free survival. The red dotted line are those who received a low dose of steroids, less than 60 milligrams, and with a delay of more than 72 hours. You can see almost 90% had an adverse event. So clearly we have to go in early and with high dose. I'll just give you a flavor of a complicated case. So it's not always straightforward. A 75 year old man, previous heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because of his previous myocardial infarct, and a baseline a mildly elevated BNP. He had five cycles of the immune checkpoint inhibitor pembrolizumab for his metastatic bladder cancer. And he presented with worsening breathlessness, new atrial fibrillation, a further decline in his ejection fraction and a rise in his BMP. Now in general medicine, this would all be related to the new AF and we wouldn't have any concerns. But of course, the question that I'm posed by the oncologist is, is it safe to continue his pembrolizumab? So his cardiac troponin is normal, and so we also always perform an MRI to look for evidence of myocardial inflammation, but he's in AF, he was breathless, and we get an equivocal report. And I have an oncologist asking me, can he have more pembrolizumab? But we know that there's a high rate of severe adverse events if this is myocarditis and he continues treatment. So we arranged a cardiac FDG PET-CT, and you'll see here that the FDG uptake in the myocardium is high and this is consistent with active cardiac inflammation. So we now have a 75 year old man worsening heart failure, equivocal MRI, positive PET-CT, but normal cardiac troponin and an oncologist asking me, can he have more pembrolizumab? So in these uncertain cases, we perform an endomyocardial biopsy. And the biopsy showed what actually the data shows, which is he had an increased infiltrate of lymphocytes, which would explain the elevated FDG signal, but actually the myocytes were intact. So his troponin was normal because he was not getting myocyte necrosis. But this I think is sufficient enough for us to uh, confirm a diagnosis of myocarditis. Just to show that in the 97 cases we've been re referred at the Royal Brompton Hospital, we do see myocarditis, but we also see this non-inflammatory heart failure where there is not evidence of inflammation on the imaging and the troponins are normal. And these patients tend to present much later. Here, the average median time to onset of this non-inflammatory heart failure is over 26 weeks. So about half a year compared to the myocarditis, which is in that first four cycles of treatment. A second example, just to show the way medicine is changing, here's a woman who had a primary melanoma resected in 2015. On routine oncology follow-up with CT, she had new abdominal lymphadenopathy and a mass in her heart. And she, her only sign was a sinus tachycardia. She was asymptomatic. And on the right, you see a cardiac MRI, and here there is a large mass within her right atrium. And hopefully you can see the movie here that the mass occupies approximately 90% of her right atrial space. Now, one of the things about checkpoint inhibitors activating the immune system to target uh, tumors is that the solid tumor mass can often expand due to inflammation before it uh, necroses and resolves. 
And she, clearly, if this expands and obstructs her right heart, that would be fatal. So we took her case to our cardio-oncology MDT. We invited our oncologists and also our cardiac surgeon. And although the surgeon would never normally take someone with cardiac melanoma metastases to the operating theater because of the poor outcomes, this lady had her melanoma metastasis resected. It was incompletely resected. There was still residual tumor that couldn't be removed. But once she recovered from her surgery, she then started her checkpoint inhibitors, which deleted the rest of the tumor in her body. And four years later, she is still alive and in oncology follow-up free of cancer. So we now see more and more cancer survivors having had immune checkpoint inhibitors. And what you'll see here is a follow-up of cardiac events as a composite over the first three years after completing checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And you'll see compared to matched cancer controls in blue who did not have treatment, in red are the group with almost a, a 4.6 hazard ratio increase in events. So not only are we now focusing on myocarditis during the acute phase, but also late heart failure and late atherosclerosis. So I'll finish by showing you this slide, which shows the multiple trials and checkpoint inhibitors. So this is a tsunami coming towards us. Reflecting that is this graph of the number of outpatient consultations that Stuart and I and the service at the Brompton deliver every year. So you can see over the last five years, it's increased by uh, over fivefold. We have the British Cardio-Oncology Society, which would invite you all to participate in and join if uh, you'd like to learn more and are interested in this field. And thank you very much. I was a whistle-stop tour, but I hope uh, it's of interest and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Alex. As ever, a uh, masterly survey of the subject, which, as you say, is, is growing at a phenomenal rate. Our fourth speaker is Dr. Emine Hatipaglu. She's a medical oncology specialist registrar at the Royal Marsden Hospital um, with particular interest in cancer metabolism and hypoxia, working with Professor Ratcliffe in Oxford, and has recently completed her PhD in tumor immunology and immunotherapy with Professor Quezada. The title of her talk is What Have We Learned About Tumor Immun Immunity from Therapeutic Vaccinations? So over to you, Emine. Hi, thank you, Dr. Raisin, for the uh, introduction and for the opportunity to um, give a talk today. Um, so today I'll be talking to you about uh, what we've learned about the, sorry, um, um, tumor immunity from therapeutic uh, vaccinations. So so first of all, I'd like to just uh, talk to you about the principles of cancer vaccines, as we have uh, heard from uh, other speakers today that uh, cancer immunotherapy is a very rapidly growing field. And so far, most of the success have come from checkpoint inhibition. However, cancer vaccines also play an important uh, role in cancer, cancer immunotherapy. And uh, it's, they usually they typically uh, involve um, exogenous administration of tumor antigens combined with adjuvants to activate dendritic cells uh, to uh, get a control over the tumor growth. Uh, so the basic principles that are required for a successful uh, therapeutic uh, uh, cancer vaccine are delivery of large amounts of uh, high quality antigens uh, for an optimal activation of the dendritic cells, um, which should then lead to a sustained and strong um, cytotoxic CD8 uh, T cell and CD4 T cell response and an optimal infiltration of the tumor microenvironment to um, get a good response in terms of tumor control. So there are different uh, types of cancer vaccines that we know about. So DNA vaccines, RNA vaccines, peptide vaccines. So the DNA vaccines um, um, can be administered I, uh, 
by IM or electroporation routes, and they usually express uh, chemokines um, in addition to the um, um, the um, DNA that they uh, include um, carry. And we also recently have heard more about RNA vaccines and. Um, um, there's also the peptide vaccines, which basically um, just deliver a, a antigen in the peptide form to the dendritic cells. And um, another form of um, a cancer vaccines we know about is uh, basically dendritic cell vaccines. This involves uh, taking the peripheral blood from the patients where the uh, monocyte-derived dendritic cells are exposed to the um, antigen in vitro, and those activated dendritic cells are then um, given back to the patient with an aim to achieve um, a, an immune response to, towards the cancer. Uh, what do we know about uh, the actual clinical translation of um, uh, cancer vaccines so far? So the first study that was uh, approved by FDA in 2010 was the impact uh, was on the back on the based on the results of the impact trial where they've used uh, sucralosal T which is the basic which is a, a cellular immunotherapy um, where they've used uh, the activated dendritic cells uh, which were um, activated with a prostate specific antigen in vitro and in this study they had uh, over 500 patients and the patients that who have received on one arm they what the patients have were given the dendritic cell vaccine on the second arm they were uh, given placebo and the results have shown a relative a risk re reduction of 22 percent in the patients who received the vaccine and there was a median survival of four point uh a long 4.1 months longer in the vaccination arm compared to the placebo arm. So that was the first study that was approved by FDA in prostate cancer. However, it hasn't always been a success story. Uh, we have had many um, um, studies that have reported uh, negative results uh, with uh, cancer vaccines. I won't go through to all of them, but just as an example, uh, in 2014, um, there was a, a pancreatic cancer study where um, they've used a GV1001 uh, uh, peptide vaccine in combination with um, gemcitabine and chemcitabine uh, chemotherapy. And they've compared this to uh, just giving patients gemcitabine and capecitabine chemotherapy alone, and they've reported that there was no um, survival benefit at all uh, when it was given in combination with the vaccine in patients who had locally advanced or microplastic disease. And there are several other studies in lung cancer, renal cancer, and several other tumor types where the cancer vaccines have uh, basically been reported as unsuccessful or with no clinical benefit. So why did it, where did we fail? Why did these studies fail? So um, one of the common things that all these studies had was that they all had um, very mixed uh, stages of disease with mixed histological subtypes. And most of these patients were actually previously treated with several lines of treatment. The antigens that they have um, e uh, selected to use for the vaccines were usually weak antigens, and um, there was an issue around self to tolerance to the antigens. Um, the some of the studies have used cancer vaccines just as single agents, and also the basic principles of immunology. What we know now, but we didn't know back in the day such as T-cell exhaustion, um, immune desert tumors, problems with antigen pre presentation were not really taken in into account when these studies were designed. But uh, more recently, we have made more progress in understanding um, and designing cancer vaccines. So one of the early but successful studies in 
cancer vaccines was um, a melanoma study, which was done in 2015 by Corona um, et al. So they have had uh, three patients with uh, stage three melanoma who were previously treated with ipilimumab. And they have taken out the tumors from those patients and they've sequenced them to look for missense mutations. And they've then translated those missense mutations into amino acids. And based on that, they've developed a dendritic cell vaccine. And here you can see that um, so they've taken looked at PBMCs from those patients uh, pre-vaccination and post-vaccination, and we can see that post-vaccination, all the patients have mounted a, a, a successful CD8 response. And they've also looked at the TCR sequences from those patients pre and post-vaccination. And what we see is that um, so the pre-existing TCR beta clonotypes have expanded post-vaccination, and also there were new clonotypes uh, that were um, seen that were specific for the new antigens post-vaccination. So that is quite um, an important uh, data in terms of understanding how the, um, the vaccines also affect the immune system in more detail, which we didn't know before. And following that, uh, in 2017, Ur Shahin and uh, Lamtoregi in Germany have reported the first in human study of individualized metanol vaccines, which basically implemented uh, an RNA based epitope to induce immune response. Um, so they've done this in melanoma patients with a cohort of 14 patients. Again, this was a mixed cohort. Um, the, the patients that they had in the study were. Um, stage three to stage four melanoma disease, uh, melanoma patients with, who had received uh, different types of treatment previously. So they had some of them had ipilimumab and some of them had targeted therapies. And what they've done is uh, they've used a more patient specific approach to develop their vaccine. They've sequenced the tumors from um, uh, the patients and they have done. Um, a mutation discovery process uh, where they've uh, basically identified new antigens for each patient and then they have uh, developed new antigen specific vaccines for each patient and those patients uh, were given up to 12 vaccinations um, during this study and we can see that those patients uh, who have received uh, the new antigen specific vaccines which were developed based on a, a in silico HLA prediction method have all mounted uh, a, a a significant uh, immune response here we can see the CD8 cells uh, which um, are detected in the peripheral blood of the patient's post-vaccination. And also those CD8 cells have uh, had increased PD-1 expression. And then they looked at the phenotypes of these CD8 cells in terms of T-cell differentiation, they all had a, a memory phenotype. And then on the right, when we uh, look at the um, tumor um, sequencing data, so post-vaccination, we can see that in the tumor, there was an upregulation of uh, genes which are involved in, um, uh, which are, which are encoded for chemokine receptors, chemokines and um, uh, immune cells such as CD8 cells, CD, CD4 cells and activatory uh, checkpoints. So this study is important in terms of demonstrating uh, the clinical feasibility um, and safety and also anti-tumor activity of um, new epitope-specific RNA-based cancer vaccines. And again, the same group a few years later have published the lipomerate study, which is a which was a phase one trial in stage uh, three to stage four melanoma patients. And in this study, they've used the liposomal RNA vaccine. This time, uh, it was. Uh, encoding for four tumor associated antigens rather than new antigens. Um, so 
they have given these vaccines <clears throat> um, in seven doses, and they've done they've actually done quite an extensive immune analysis. I won't go through all of them, but essentially um, they've had 89 patients in the study, and 30 of those patients uh, were given just the vaccine, and 26 had the vaccination in combination with anti-PD-1 therapy. And they have seen both CD8 and CD4 responses. And uh, more recent studies also show that, um, you know, CD4 cells are just as important as CD8 cells in terms of mounting an immune response to cancer vaccines. Um, so they have... Uh, so some of those patients, one of the patients in the uh, vaccination alone group had a complete response. Um, quite a few patients had partial response. And obviously there were um, about nine patients in the combination group had progressive disease and 14 patients in the vaccination alone group had progressive disease. Um, this study is important because um, it demonstrated that the T cells uh, that were activated by the uh, vaccine were fully functional, and they did specifically recognize the the epitopes uh, on the melanoma cells, and they did really exhibit a strong cytotoxic activity based on the ELISA assays they've done on the PBMCs. Um, the long term. Thank, thank, thank you so much. I'm going to cut across you because okay. I'm going to start the questions with you. Okay. And, um, that is, uh, you've given us a wonderful review of the topic, and actually, you were in the difficult slot because that's after everyone else and the time gets eaten up. But I'd like to put a question to you and mm -hmm. jointly to you and to John, and that is how far a combination of the two techniques offers opportunities for thus far very difficult to treat tumors, particularly solid tumors. Can you, um, can you envisage a, a form of engineering which partly relies on vaccine production and partly on T cell uh, engineering? I think in terms of the vaccines, uh, so the data that's available uh, at the moment is based on very small cohorts of patients. So I think more data is required in terms of the clinical efficacy. But in terms of safe, safety, we know that mRNA vaccines have been su quite safe and successful in terms of short-term follow-up based on the COVID-19 pand pandemic. But I think combination therapy is important because most of the successful trials so far uh, are reported in studies where they've used the cancer vaccines in combination with either checkpoint inhibitors or other other forms of uh, you know immunotherapy. So I think probably making the tumor environment more uh, immune hot um, would uh, would improve the clinical outcome. John, what do you feel about that? Yeah, I think it's a great question, and it's actually already happening. So um, Ugar Sahin, who's obviously come to fame because of the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine, he has also been using mRNA vaccines in combination with a Claudin-6 targeted CAR. And um, this has been trialed in patients mainly with uh, testicular cancer, but relapsed refractory disease. So the idea is you give um, a first generation CAR, so no co-stimulatory signal, in combination with an mRNA vaccine, which presents the antigen in the draining lymph node, thereby providing co-stimulation to those T cells. And it seems to work actually, because he has had a complete response and six partial responses in an ongoing phase one clinical trial. So I think it looks potentially very promising. Obviously the downside is it's hard enough to develop one drug. So when you're developing combinations, two brand new drugs, that obviously adds to the challenge. Which brings me to Alex. Does all of that make you a little more nervous? Um, not nervous. On one hand, I'm always optimistic for new oncology that. treatments because the main issue here is to treat the cancer, but it's how we do it safely. And, you know, we have difficult situations where people have had a mild myocarditis so or an incidental one where they've never even presented clinically. Yet the cancer is progressing, maybe be challenged. And then if they break through what next immune system treatment, and I, as well as understanding how 
target the malignancy, we need a lot more work on what they're doing in or, it, triggering autoimmune diseases. And as we say, the success, the tail of this is then the survivors and long-term effects. So, um, but it's a nice problem to have compared to oncology in the 1970s and 80s. Absolutely, absolutely. Zed, have you got some thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it's to mirror a lot of what Alex has said, and Alex and I worked for a couple of years together managing our various array of toxicities that we derive from the broadening application of our systemic treatment. And it is, it's that fine balance between efficacy and toxicity. And as I mentioned, some of the work that we're doing in the lab, and I know a lot of other groups are doing, is really trying to interrogate that biomarker space, not only in terms of efficacy, but also in terms of uh, predicting toxicity. And then you find that balance of, well, if you do find that biomarker, does that mean that patient should, you would preclude you from going on treatment? And that's the unanswered question. Great. Um, any questions from our other attendees? If so, please put them on the chat now. And we've got about 10 whole seconds for me to process them. If not, then I'm sure that you could possibly email them afterwards uh, if you've got some good questions. We've had uh, a, a wonderful experience today to, to look at the real front line of biomedical research cautiously um, put in the context of clinical consequences, but I really am hugely grateful to each and every one of our speakers who is a leader in their field. And thank you very much on behalf of the Association of Physicians and from all who participated today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.